let's first discuss what net filter connection tracking is actually about. So basically, it's flow tracking by addresses of the endpoints. So in layer 3 or 4, you might have IP addresses and ports, or IP addresses and GRE call IDs, and some things like that. Um, programmatically, in NetFilter, we have split the trackings in layer 3 and layer 4. So the layer 4 tracking modules like TCP or UDP only exist once, and they don't care if they run on top of IPv4 or IPv6. They try to keep state. So the TCP tracker actually will check, look at TCP sequence numbers. It looks at TCP flags. It can detect invalid flag combinations. It can uh, adjust timeouts when it sees that data has been sent in one direction and not yet been acknowledged by the peer. So we can evict connections early when the peer suddenly goes down and doesn't r uh, respond anymore. We delete de uh, connections quickly when we see resets and also will close down internally the state when we see fin exchanges on the wire. Contract itself never alters packets, and net is built on top in netfilter. So in netfilter, net is always uh, stateful. Um, the contract subsystem hooks into um, netfilter, so at before the routing lookup and as packets go out, to observe packets on the wire as they come and leave the system. Another nice feature is um, the connection tracking event subsystem, which allows user space to subscribe to whatever is happening in the internal state machine. So your user space can get notifications about new connections, about connections as they are deleted, about changes in the state, so for instance, transitions from established to closing, or um, when an IP tables rules changes the con mark, it always generates events that user space can subscribe to. This is especially useful to, for instance, implement flow accounting in user space by ulogd, or um, to um, track what's happening in the system. So, um, for instance, con track can also do byte accounting and packet accounting to see how much data was transferred on a connection. It's also possible to restrict what kinds of events are generated. So in very large setups where there are a lot of events, you can uh, use IP table CT target to um, restrict what kind of events you are interested in to reduce the load. There are unfortunately a bun bunch of misconceptions about contracts. So the most common that I hear is that IP tables has something to do with connection tracking. That's not true. So if you use the IP tables contract match, then that doesn't do connection tracking at all. It just checks the packet state as determined by the earlier connection tracking step. And the same is true for the NF tables counterpart. Also, contract does not look at socket states at all. It just looks at packets as they come in and go. So um, there is no extra check of the TCP stack in the kernel. Contract supports several different states. The most common one you will see is established, which is basically always true when we have an existing entry and the layer 4 tracker checks pass, so TCP flex combinations are OK, packets in, in window, and so on and so forth. The other one is new, which ha will happen when we have no previous record at all. And in this, that case, we will try to um, allocate a new connection tracking entry. But we will not place it in the main table until after all the IP tables rules have been passed. That's basically an optimization, because um, adding to the table requires taking logs. And um, if you are being flooded and packets are being dropped, then there's no point in taking the extra penalty of adding and deleting to the contract table. Um, so um, in contract speak, an entry is always confirmed as soon as it, it enters the main table. Another state is related, which is basically exactly the same as new, except that the packet relates, or the new flow relates in some way to something we already have a record of. So for example, if you receive an IPv6 packet to big message, we will actually extract the original header of the packet that generated the event. We'll look that up, and if we see that we have a record of that flow, then it will be related and not new. And the same is true for the connection tracking helpers. More on that later. 
which can have this magic expectation table where we can basically make records of flows that we ex uh, expect to see in the near future. And the last state that is untracked, which is for packets that either are you don't want to be tracked, you can do that in IP tables with the CT target, or for IPv6 cases where we do not track intentionally, for instance, uh, neighbor discovery, because it's basically IPv6 equivalent to IPv4 ARP, and we don't track that either. And invalid is not a state at all, because it basically means that there is no contract entry, so there is no state. And that will happen whenever the, the connection tracking engine thinks that something is wrong with the packet. So TCP out of sequence will not be dropped by contract. It's marked as invalid, so users can drop it in their rule sets. Connection tracking helpers. So unfortunately, there are some weird protocols that are pretty hard to track and especially provide net for. That's especially true for SIP, uh, H323, and FTP, and so on. So um, basically, for contract modules, it's always uh, for the contract helper modules, it's always the same. They try to monitor the layer seven data on the control channel. So in the FTP case, you will monitor for port commands on the control channel and uh, parse the addresses that are being exchanged. And every, whenever you see one, then there is an entry added to the expectation table with that address, so that when the data connection comes in, we will know about it. And we can also apply automatically any net transformation on the control channel automatically, so users don't have to fudge with extra net rules for the data channel or voice channel or, or whatever protocol we're tracking. This is best effort only, so we do not do TCP stream reassembly, so when port commands get split over several packets, then this will simply not work, but it's good enough in practice. Unfortunately, this also means that we have some pretty hard to understand and probably even faulty code in the kernel, especially the ASN1 parser for the HC23 helper, which basically no one has ever looked at ever since it was added, and I'm not even sure if it works. So um, it's in a lot of cases for these protocols, it would be preferable to do this in user space by using something like tproxy um, to um, send packets for the data channel to a proxy application. And nowadays, we provide in the kernel user space API, so user space can, in fact, in, uh, inject expectations into the kernel. So you only have to monitor control connections. And for instance, if you see a SIP invite message, then you could add the expectation of the um, actual voice calls into the kernel so that all of that gets uh, passed through in the kernel and not uh, take the penalty of sending that to user space. The main connection tracking table nowadays um, is completely lockless for all read accesses. And we can even do parallel adds and delete operations on the table, provided that they occur in different slots of the table. This is mostly the work of Eric Dumasee, and then later revived by Jesper Dengert Brauer. Um, the table has a fixed size that is exposed via SysCTL, and there is no um, automated growth. So we just pick an initial value based on the memory of the system and leave it to the system administrator to um, make adjustments as needed for the given workload. Every entry is hashed twice, once in the origin and once in the reply direction. The reason for that is network address translation, of course, because if we have a net mapping and the reply comes back, we don't have the original IP address anymore on the wire. Um, and we would not find a match in the contract entry. That's why we also hash the netted address, so we can from that conclude what the original address is and um, how to apply the reverse mappings. Because um, we have a lot of features in contract, like events and byte accounting and um, timestamps and um, connection tracking helpers. Um, the contract um, entry would be pretty big. That's why we have this thing called extensions, which allows us to um, offload the rarely um, used stuff into an external blob that is linked from the contract entry. So the good side is we save a lot of memory for um, common setups that don't use these features. But um, we take some overhead because we have some metadata that tracks what extensions are ac actually allocated and in place. 
and we need one extra dereference de to obtain whatever the extension data we are interested in. NAT, as I already said, is built on top of the connection tracking engine, and they are always created at um, contract creation time, so for the new packet state. And that's also the reason why the IP table's NAT table always only sees the first packet in a flow, because it's essentially just a mapping database of addresses to address. We also have to maintain one extra hash table, the so-called by source table, which all the connections, regardless if they have NAT applied or not, get added to, because we have to detect a case where, for example, we have an outgoing connection from the router, and uh, another connection comes in that gets mapped to the same address that would collide. So we have to detect this collision and then provide um, a new port translation for the new connection. So now for overflow handling, that's a bit um, of a difficult topic. So whenever the contract table gets full, you will see this message logged by the kernel, table full dropping packet. Um, the main assumption here is that most entries are not assured. What does that mean? So assured is a special flag in the contract entry that gets set by the higher layer protocol tracker like TCP whenever a certain event has passed. So for instance, in the TCP case, we have seen the full three-way handshake. So for instance, if you get SYN flooded, then most of your entries in the contract table will not be assured and are therefore candidates for early evictions, which means that we try to toss one of these out and make room for uh, the new connection. And that's done uh, by searching the next eight buckets in the table where the new connection would have been uh, assigned to. And then if it's not assured, we destroy it and allocate a new entry in its place. And otherwise we have to drop the new packet. So what's the problem with that? Um, so we can only ever drop uh, non-assured entries, and there's no way if a new table, uh, if a new packet is more important than any of the other entries that we already have. So we can't just go um, around widely and just evict random entries because we could evict something very important. And it also does not play nice with a network address translation because the state is in the contract table, so whenever you destroy something, you lose the mappings for that flow. And then, of course, there is the case um, of overflow with legitimate traffic patterns. So yes, of course, the administrator can always increase the connection tracking table if resources allow this. But it's also possible that um, some endpoint just went away without having outstanding data, for instance. And we have pretty, pretty long timeouts in some cases by default. So what could we do about it? So some ideas here are um, to remove some rather strange contract error handling, and I would basically say it's a bug. So for instance, if a packet is always uh, is invalid, then we always pass it on to the filter, IP tables or NF tables, and users can decide what they want to do with the invalid packet, like pass or drop or log or whatever. But in case we cannot allocate a contract entry because we are over the limit, then automatically we will drop the packet instead of <coughs> saying it's invalid and leaving the decision to the user. One of the questions here is, of course, if we can just change the behavior without potentially risking some setup becoming insecure, insecure or whatever. So maybe we'll have to, new, uh, to add a new syscontrol to make this behavior configurable. Another problem here is that this does not um, solve the table exhaustion problem for our cases because you cannot um, fundamentally track um, uh, net um, non-tracked packets. Therefore, another maybe better suggestion is to add an early drop callback to the layer four trackers. So instead of um, just going around and trying to evict a random entry, ask the layer four tracker if this is an early drop candidate, even if it's in a short state. So we have very, very large default timeouts, so like five days for, for established, and even if you lower it to something reasonable, it's like, like, it's like, like say five minutes we could um, still um, make some use of the knowledge that the layer four tracker has. So for instance, if we are under pressure, we could, um, we could try to um, 
early evict flows that are already in fin state or closing. And we could, under pressure, just kill those off and allow a new entry to come in. Another thing is that we, nowadays we do have um, a background worker for the, that takes care of evicting contract entries. So you could extend that theoretically to inject uh, egg probing into the a connection to see if it's still alive if we are not sure. And that of course might be a bit controversial because nowadays contract is passive and doing egg probing is uh, definitely not passive anymore. Another thing that we could look into is implementing adaptive timeouts. That's something that is implemented in the BSDs. So um, for instance, we could um, combine um, the timeout switch that we already have for the CD target with a match on um, how much or what, how big the fraction of used table slots is uh, currently, which is not possible to match on, but it would be easy to add a match that uh, you can say um, match if more than 80% of the table is full or something like that, and then configurably lower the timeouts um, during connection setup. We could, of course, only, um, also prefer to evict um, those contracts that have a net null binding, that is, um, they don't translate to a different address or different port pair, because for those, we could rebuild state if necessary. Um, another problem, of course, is that even under flood, lowering timeouts does not really help, so even one minute is just too long. But it does help with peers that do not close properly, so it's definitely something that I would like to um, look into adding in the near future. So, in summary, Contract does have a pretty major code base and lots of features, but there is still some room for improvements. So, as we have seen, the overflow handling could be improved. I'm also looking into um, removing the need to um, wait for an RCU grace period to delete the extension blob that we have in the kernel, because nowadays all the excesses with two exceptions occur after obtaining a reference count on the connection tracking entry, so we are sure that we own it and it can't go away. And another thing that we could uh, look into is uh, removing variable size extensions. So right now we support um, that you can um, define a, an extension and det determine at setup time of the connection how big a space the extension requires. But actually I don't think this is really useful anymore because um, for the the only extension that makes use of this is the helper extension. And all the helpers that we have in the kernel only need like 20 or 30 bytes tops. So the idea is to just add a, add a scratch area similar to the SKB control buffer that we have in the kernel. And then remove the var size extensions. The big advantage of doing that is that it would allow us to um, add a build time assertions to check what the maximum size of all the extensions that we support is. And that might allow us to also reduce some offsets that we have to lower um, quantities to save some space in the metadata. <coughs> so that's it. Any questions? questions? So you've been talking a lot about TCP. Are there any plans to support Quick? Um, so um, not yet. Someone would have to look at the Quick protocol and how to tell it apart from plain UDP flows that we can track. But um, no, not yet. So, so you're talking about one of the problems being the, um, uh, the when the table gets full, and I think a lot of people, like there's various different posts on the line, if you see the table full dropping packet, like people get very confused about this. Um, and so if, we, if there's a way to improve, certainly that would, that would be great. Uh, I wondered like in terms of doing something like an LRU where you can see like these connections aren't receiving traffic over a long period, is, do you think there's like some way we could integrate a mechanism that could just bump old? Um, less active flow uh, connections or something. 
Yeah, so one idea was to add a new syscontrol like a soft um, timeout that doesn't do anything under normal conditions, but whenever we hit a limit and we find that the connection we are looking at is past that, then just zap it. That was one idea. If you have other ideas, I'm all ears. So the, the whole connection table overflow situation is kind of like the routing cache, except that you have this class of entries that are non-reconstitutable in, in that case, is, for example, right? So it, it seems like an even more difficult problem than the routing cache was in many aspects. So one advantage we have over the routing cache is that we actually have TCP information, like uh, is this connection closing or not? Right. Actually, uh, Robert Olson had a bunch of hacks where he would actually look for the fins and kill routing cache entries when a fin would arrive and things like that. But yeah, that's exactly what the connection tracker is able to do. So I don't know. I, have you thought about garbage collection scans when you get into overflow mode or anything like that? Yeah, so nowadays we always have garbage collection active in the background anyway because contracts, but connection put, tracking entries don't have timers anymore. You put, them into a, you put it into a more aggressive mode when we hit this overflow situation. Yeah, that was like one for idea, example, yeah. like you said, there's these timers that only apply when we're in overflow mode. So the garbage collector can yeah. set the trim, trim the timer. Yeah. So the idea was that whenever we detect that there is an overflow, that we we always schedule the garbage collection worker for an instant execution. Yes. Uh, so I want to thank you to work on this uh, contracting infra, which is uh, kind of uh, difficult to. Manage. Um, so yeah, the, for the variable timeout idea, I think it makes sense. Uh, we have in TCP stack um, variable CNAC retransmission logic, uh, depending on how the, uh, the the scene receive socket table virtual table is uh, filled. Uh, when we reach the limit of this table, we no longer send. Um, many SYNAC per, per scene receive socket. So that's an idea, effectively, that could uh, be applied to contracting. Yeah, I will look at it. Thanks for the pointer. Any more? Let's give Florina a hand of applause. Then.